I'd like to call to order the regular formal meeting of the Iowa City City Council for October the 2nd, 2018. Roll call, please. Cole. Here. Mims. Here. Sully. Here. Taylor. Here. Thomas. Here. Throgmorton. Here. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to your city hall. It's a real pleasure to see all of you. And I'm just thinking about um, the kind of chaos we see taking place in other parts of our country. And um, I don't want to get too political about this, but I hope um, what you find when you come to City Hall and observe us working is that we are trying to do our best for the people of this city. And despite uh, differences that appear among us from time to time, that's what all of us are trying to do. So with that, we have two proclamations to read tonight. And the first has to do with Fire Prevention Week. All right, is, is Brian here? Yeah. So let me read this, Brian, and so you, uh, you, you, you can sit if you want or you can stand if you want. So, whereas the city of Iowa City is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and visiting Iowa City, and whereas fire is a serious public safety concern both locally and nationally, and homes are the locations where people are at greatest risk from fire, and whereas home fires killed 3,400 people in the United States in 2017, according to the National Fire Protection Association, and fire departments in the United States responded to 357,000 home fires. And whereas working smoke alarms cut the risk of dying in reported home fires in half, and three out of five home fire deaths result from fires in properties without working smoke alarms, and whereas half of home fire deaths result from fires reported at night between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. when most people are asleep, and whereas Iowa City first responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection education, and whereas Iowa City residents are responsive to public education measures and are able to take personal steps to increase their safety from fire, especially in their homes, and whereas the 2018 Fire Prevention Week theme, Look, Listen, Learn, Be Aware, Fire Can Happen Anywhere, effectively reminds us to look for places fire could start, listen for the sound of the smoke alarm, and learn two ways out of every room. Now, therefore, I, James A. Throgmorton, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim October 7 to 13, 2018, as Fire Prevention Week throughout the city and urge everyone to install smoke alarms and to support the many public, act public safety activities and efforts during Fire Prevention Week 2018 and year round. So, Brian, could you come up and get this, please? I'd just like to add a couple other things on to this. Um, Fire Prevention Week starts this Sunday and goes through the, through the week there, but we don't consider it just to be a, a weekly thing. We consider fire prevention to be year-round. We want to make sure that people are safe. A little history on, uh, on, on Fire Prevention Week. It, it's in remembrance of the Great Chicago Fire from October 8th, 1871. It actually, they started doing remembrance in 1922. Then the president in 1925 made it its annual um, week that we look at, at fires and, and what we can do to, to, to prevent or at least minimize them. As the proclamation said, the, the main topics out of this particular year are to make sure we look for places that fires may start. You know, we have places in our houses that that may be unsafe. If you see an unsafe thing in your house, or even if you're at a friend's house, 
Go ahead and let them know or take care of the issue so that we don't have to worry about it. Listen, make sure you know what your smoke alarm sounds like. Make sure it's working. We want to make sure that we'll have another proclamation in a couple weeks for change your clock, change your batteries. Make sure that they have batteries in them so that they work. We want to make sure that they're working properly. They, if it's inter an interconnected one in your house, make sure they all go off if one goes off. And take a look at them. If they're over 10 years old, on the back side of, of the smoke detector, there will be, at the smoke alarm, there will be a date. 10 years from that date, they're supposed to be replaced. So we want to do that. And the last thing is learn. Make sure we know two ways out of every every room. That's that's imperative. We teach the kids at, at the schools all these different things. And we're actually starting tomorrow, well, Thursday, I guess, we have our first fire prevention week programs at the elementary schools. It's a, it's a great thing that we do with puppetry, uh, full-size puppetoons, and, and it gets the kids to learn some of these fire prevention weeks and, and, and just basically stuff that's fire safety. And, you know, we, we do a lot of stuff with the kids, but fire safety education is not for the kids. Everyone's affected by fires at some point or another, whether it's something that happened at your, your house, a friend's house, or just what you see in the media. So we just want to make sure everybody's safe. And, and the, the, I'm just going to go with age, but there's a lot of other social demographics. But kids or youths under the age of five and people over the age of 65 are the two biggest categories for people getting hurt in fires. So, you know, we, we try to do what we can to educate not only those groups, but every group. And with that, I'd just like to thank you guys, um, Mayor Throgmorton and Council, for being behind us and everything. And, and we hope you all have a safe night. Thank you, Brian. You remind me of when I was a child, Brian. I was somewhere around eight or nine years old, and I heard I was upstairs in uh, the two-story house that I lived in, and I heard crackling in the other room. I couldn't figure out what it was. I went in there, and I saw two candles. They had burned down, and they were burning into the wood uh, on a cabinet or whatever that was in, in the other room. And if I hadn't walked in there, at that moment, probably five minutes later, it would have s spread, and then then what? You know, the, the whole building would have been damaged and so on, and maybe worse. So thanks for doing this. Thank you. Okay. Next item is a proclamation having to do with Indigenous Peoples Day. Whereas the United States endorsed the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People on December 16, 2010, and whereas since then, an increasing number of local governments, including Iowa City, have recognized the second Monday in October as Indigenous Peoples Day in celebration of the historic and contemporary cultural significance of the First Nations of the Americas, and whereas the city wishes to promote awareness, understanding, and positive relations among Indigenous peoples and all other members of our community, and whereas the city seeks to promote equity for indigenous peoples through policies and practices that combat prejudices and eliminate discrimination stemming from colonization, and whereas the city strongly encourages institutions, businesses, and residents to invest in learning more about Native American history, beliefs, and culture in order to build a greater understanding and partnership with our local Native American residents. Now, therefore, I, James A. Throgmorton, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby declare October the 8th, 2018, as Indigenous Peoples Day in Iowa City. Joe? Bonjour, Nikan Mike. Be quiet, be quiet. Hello, my friends. Thank you, thank you. It means a great deal uh, to me uh, for the council to take this action uh, now for the second year and subsequently. I'm Joe Coulter, a member of the 
citizen Potawatomi Nation. Uh, I work on the Human Rights Commission here in Iowa City. We have 574 federally recognized tribes here in the United States. 80 of these tribes have a historical connection to the state of Iowa, and Iowa and Iowa City take their name from the Iowa tribe, which is still there, uh, although they're located in Kansas now. <laughs> I look forward to helping educate our community uh, and thanking them for recognizing the Native people from this America. Thank you, Big Thank you Joe. Okay, items three through eight. Consider adoption of the consent calendar as presented or amended. So move. Second. Moved by Soe, seconded by Mims. Discussion. You can't bite your letter. Mm -hmm. No, okay. Um, Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throckmorton? <coughs> yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item nine, community comment. Uh, anyone who would like to address us on any topic that is not on the formal meeting agenda is invited to do so now. Please come up, state your name, and then please limit your comments to not more than five minutes. Good evening, Charlie. Good evening. My name is Charlie Eastham, 11 9 by 3 Canton Street in Iowa City. Earlier, earlier in your uh, work session this, after, this evening, uh, the council discussed uh, uh, the uh, staff's uh, South District Partnership Plan, which involves uh, the uh, city eventually purchasing up to two duplexes on Taylor and Davis Street in Southeast Iowa City, and selling, uh, which are uh, uh, would be uh, rental properties at the time of purchase, and then selling those properties uh, at a uh, relatively low price. During the during the during the discussion, I thought Councilmember Salee uh, made some uh, important and very substantive. Uh, observations about this program and objections to it, which came from her personal experience, uh, and uh, I hope the council would have would have paid more attention to her uh, to her comments. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, the uh, this uh, project was um, subjected to an equity toolkit review at the request of the Housing and Community Development Commission. Um, and I want to say that I was, uh, and a couple other commission members, were instrumental in getting the commission to uh, make that request to the staff. When the staff was, when this project was originally uh, uh, brought before the HCDC, uh, it had not had an equity toolkit review, and uh, the staff was not at that time planning to have one. The purpose of the, of the equity toolkit review is to see if the project has a racial and ethnic effect. It's not necessarily an economic effect, a racial and ethnic effect. And I would say that the uh, the uh, report to the, of the, of the, that was contained in your memo shows that the project actually will have a racial and eth eth uh, ethnic effect. And, uh, I, and the staff has made some uh, changes to the original proposal, which they uh, assert will uh, reduce the effect uh, and increase the benefit. I, don't, I think the staff has overlooked some things. Uh, I think uh, uh, Councilwoman uh, Sally, uh, Sally actually uh, made a very good uh, uh, recommendation to change the program uh, uh, operational plan such that purchases of rental units on Taylor and Davis Street would be done only when the occupants of those units, the renters of those units, uh, say that they would like to have the opportunity to purchase them and that they have, in fact, uh, the uh, income and uh, 
um, <coughs> credit uh, references that would support uh, their being able to obtain a mortgage and thereby to uh, to p purchase the unit. I think just making the uh, <coughs> the uh, purchase uh, 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 or the ability to to uh, buy a unit a pre uh, given as a preference uh, at the time the city is deciding which units to to, uh, to purchase is not is not strong enough. Um, and uh, I also think that uh, given the results of the uh, toolkit analysis, uh, the equity analysis, which shows that the percentage of uh, African-American families in this area is much higher than it is uh, citywide, uh, that providing that kind of a uh, um, of an option to to uh, to uh, purchase units uh, made available to current residents would actually increase home ownership among African American and Hispanic uh, households and families in, in this area in a way which simply giving a preference would not. The staff uh, included in their uh, toolkit analysis a description of um, uh, some similar situations they claim in the Miller Orchard neighborhood, where university uh, uh, the uh, uh, a university approach was applied was uh, applied to that neighborhood. Around 10 homes, I think, uh, originally were purchased there under the university program, uh, uh, re rehabilitated and sold to to home buyers. Those homes were converted from rental ownership. But the staff also recognizes uh, said uh, uh, flatly that buyers of those 10 homes in Miller Orchard were, came from outside of the Miller Orchard uh, neighborhood. Uh, the staff also said they did not know what the racial demographics were of the 10 or so households that bought those homes. Um, and the staff also indicated that the that was a good program because uh, property values actually increased in the Miller Orchard neighborhood uh, along with the, uh, inst uh, the along with the uh, project pace. However, the uh, the table that shows property values incre increasing in the Miller Orchard neighborhood actually shows increases in values that are about the same throughout the, the community. Um, so I. Th I in, and uh, my request would be that the council pay a good, a lot of attention to the uh, recommendations of uh, Maza here and have the staff improve the language and the plan for the South District uh, Partnership so that home buyers are almost for sure going to be people living in the Taylor Davis uh, streets. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Lori Crawford. I moved to Iowa City two years ago, and I picked the house I picked because it's in the woods and there's a lot of wildlife there. And that's what I wanted. I was surprised when I moved here to hear recently that people in Iowa City were complaining about the deer. I moved here, one reason was that it's an educated community and a progressive community, and I was really hoping to avoid issues like this. I was involved in an issue like this in Cedar Rapids for a number of years. I served on the Deer Task Force there as well. The primary complaint of letter writers and people who spoke at the Deer Committee meeting was their plants. Um, killing one deer doesn't stop another deer from eating a plant. Killing one deer doesn't stop another deer from crossing the road. Non-lethal methods, such as education and preventive measures, allow people to protect their plants and empowers them to take care of their own property. Killing deer doesn't work because the populations rebound. As long as there's sufficient food, there will be deer for that food. And we've learned in past studies that the litters are even larger after a kill. Even Dina Cola, who spoke at the deer committee meeting, said we've been doing this for 30 years and nothing has changed. <clears throat> so we need to find solutions other than killing. There are non-lethal solutions such as education, preventive measures like fencing, spraying for deer. I sent you a letter about wildlife crossings. About half the states in the country have implemented wildlife crossings. If you do decide to kill, which I hope you won't, I urge you to do sharpshooting versus bow hunting. Sharpshooting lasts for a few days. 
bow hunting lasts for four and a half months. For four and a half months, you have hunters in your community. You have divided neighbors. You have people who want hunting living right next door to people who don't. And it caused many problems in Cedar Rapids. I, uh, hunting, bow hunting has a 50% wounding rate. So a neighbor is likely to find a wounded or dying or even dead deer in their yard. The DNR has told the hunters they have permission to enter my yard, even though it's posted non-hunting, to finish off a deer. I have many photos of wounded and dead deer. I have photos of deer with arrows in their face, if anyone's interested in having visual information about bow hunting. In summary, killing is a knee-jerk reaction. This is always the reaction to nuisance wildlife. I encourage us instead to respond. Let's not react. Let's gather more information about non-lethal methods and learn to coexist with deer. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Good evening. Hi, I'm Allison Janes, and I'm at 1181 Hots Avenue in Iowa City. And I'm also here to speak about the deer management plan. So I know that you might talk about this in the continuation of the work session after the open council meeting. So I'm hoping that even though we can't comment during that work session that the comments we're making now uh, will stay with you when you're talking about this after this meeting is over. So my main message to you is to, I urge you to slow down and not make any decisions right away. And that's what I want you to take into this work session when you do your discussion. I know that there's um, some pressure being put on you from various neighborhoods, various people, but I would really urge you to slow down until there's more information gathered, until there's been more chance for the public to have input on this. I know that there's been a lot of misinformation uh, spread through White Buffalo and Associates, and maybe not intentionally, but there's been a lot of misinformation surrounding this issue. Traffic accidents that didn't occur, uh, Lyme disease that's not spread by deer, and so forth. So there's some things here that need to be cleared up before you can really make an informed decision. We've uh, There's a few of us here tonight, and there's a larger group that couldn't make it. We've put together a website where we have a lot of information about uh, how you can do some deterrent methods for deer, uh, what the real issues are with, with the deer problem. I mean, we all live in this city, and we know that they're not, there's not deer just clogging the streets and knocking down doors, right? So it hasn't come to the point where you really have to make this knee-jerk reaction to go ahead and, and call the order and to do the sharpshooting. And then I also wanted to say, just, as, just to end this, um, that to go back to Mayor Throgmorton's point at the beginning, that there is a lot of chaos going on, and we're not like that here in Iowa City. We don't, I hope we don't want to do just these backdoor deals where the public isn't involved and the public isn't informed. And that's a little bit what I feel like the, the DEER task force has been like. There hasn't been a lot of uh, back and forth with the council. There's, there was the, the committee meeting, or the community, um, input meeting where the council was not present, but there hasn't been a lot of back and forth between the community and the council, except for the petition that we were able to send in, which had over 500 signatures asking to explore non-lethal methods to control the deer population or prevent them from doing harm to public property and private property. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Allison. Good evening. Hi there. I'm Nancy Bird at the Iowa City Downtown District. Um, we prepared a quick slideshow real, real quickly um, for public comment tonight because we wanted to make sure and let you know what the Iowa City Downtown District is working on with regard to some of our retail incentives. Um, so as you know, in 2017, we went through a program called Cosign, and it was a very successful program where we brought artists and business and fabricators together to develop additional wayfinding for the streets um, and for the storefronts with 12 new creative signs that went up um, in 2017. Well, this year we're working on a new program. Uh, this fall we're developing the actual uh, parameters of the parameters of the program, and then in the spring we'll release it. But we thought it would be helpful to bring it to council tonight, kind of the draft program, so that you understand some of the real nuances of this uh, of this um, 
um, of this uh, cosine plus is what we're calling it. And um, the your dollars are part of this um, program. Uh, $10,000 we're receiving from the city of Iowa City that was planned in the economic development program. So we're really appreciative of that. We'll also have some sponsor income that will support it and the Iowa City Downtown District will also support um, with the, the expenses. So um, I don't I want to make sure and not go over my time, but what I wanted to do was just talk to you about, like I said, the changes that we'll be um, providing and let you know a little bit about the um, some of the lessons that we learned during that time was that, uh, number one, that there was a lot of interest around it, and it really did help. Um, it's a data-driven uh, concept that you know a better sign will help support the marketing of that business. The wayfinding element is also very important, but what we did is really try to use the design guidelines that were prepared as um, uh, to offer the guidance for how these signs should be put up and to encourage more pedestrian-oriented signs. Um, we learned a lot through that process. Um, we recognize the fact that um, signs are costly. Um, the incentives we were providing were, were lower, and um, the stores that have been there for a long time were really cognizant of that. So this time around, we're trying to increase the incentive offered. Um, that the opportunities for storefront enhancements can be um, encouraged based on those guidelines. We continue to use them. And that we probably need to do a little bit more um, hand-holding, I would say, between the stores and the artists and the fabricators that are involved. Uh, Thomas Agrin and Betsy Potter will be supporting the implementation, sort of like Nate Kading and Thomas did last time, um, but it'll be a, a nuanced approach. Uh -oh. I'll go on to my next slide here. There we go. Um, so the mission is really about pedestrian-oriented signs and wayfinding because we know that we have um, you know, 350 businesses downtown and many people still don't know who they all are. Uh, and the goals are very similar to last time, is really to foster the sense um, of an authentic place. Um, Cosign in itself hasn't been done in very many places or around the country. Cosign Plus is a unique addition that we're in Iowa City adding to that program. We'll continue to work with the, um, with the American Sign Museum in Cincinnati and we'll be talking to them about how we're tailoring that program, which is branded and has a trademark, um, to see if they want to include some of these elements into their program. So it's kind of a, a, a fun way to work with them, and they're, they're very interested in that approach. Um, again, the goal is to bring back creative signing, a signage, so we will certainly focus on signs. Boy, I'm really not doing well with my, my uh, um, PowerPoint here. Um, the creative signage is important, but also the storefront improvements. So the plus element will really relate to other improvements to the storefront. So um, we have a couple pictures here to, to talk about. Jeez, Louise. Sorry, guys. Nothing like uh, kind of screwing up the uh, <laughs> delivery of the PowerPoint to get in the way of your message. Um, these images were important just to demonstrate really how a color for storefront could look different and um, draw your eye. So we have um, some examples of what paint, what door plates uh, at the bottom, how they can draw your eye, uh, new, new doors, um, illumination, all kinds of different ways to really make the downtown a more authentic um, place. So that is the piece that we will be offering that will be in addition to the um, cosine element. And here's some examples of just some of the fun signs that were um, established uh, last year. Um, and then, you know, this merchandise zone piece is in the design guidelines. And one of the things that a lot of people don't know about this right now is that it is a permit, in a permit right now, there's a retailing permit that um, the downtown district applies for annually. And there are some guidelines around that. So we're trying to encourage the retailers to actually pull out some of their merchandise in front of the store under that permit. So some tweaks are going to be made to the permit so that we can encourage a storefront that looks more like the, the last slide. So the, the timeline for this is really trying to establish the rules and regulations this fall, um, get the applications, the submissions, and all those things out to all the different property owners so they participate. And then in January and March, we'll really start um, uh, with those workshops. And we'll be doing those in tandem with the city because there is the facade, um, uh, the larger building change program that will be happening too. And so our goal is to work with the city so they're really communicating all three of those programs to the entire retail community. Um, so building change and cosign, the opportunities with the building change program of Iowa cities is that you know there's the larger storefront enhancements, 
and then with the um, the co-signed storefront, and then the smaller option will be the other um, paint and door plates and things like that. So there'll be multiple levels and tiers of financial um, contributions the stores can uh, can, can uh, get involved with. So the key takeaways here is that we're trying to really expand the impact of Cosign, grow it in a way that other communities are taking a look at, um, and then also work with the city to really try and do our best to incentivize really great um, uh, buildings and making sure that um, when people come to Iowa City and there's pictures of Iowa City, you know exactly where, you're, you, where you are, that you can't be anywhere else in the country and look like we do downtown. Um, I think there's you know, long-lasting enhancements for the business, for the, for the downtown, and for the entire community. We hope this is a model that we can hopefully import to other places, other neighborhoods, and so that um, others can benefit from it as well. So as we go through this process, um, we hope to hear um, if you have any feedback for it. Um, we certainly want to encourage others to, to use it, so we'll be out advertising. But because of the three tiers, we want to make sure that everybody kind of knows the different nuances of the program. And we certainly appreciate your support. So uh, we look forward to working more with the city staff, and um, there's a lot more information to come in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Good evening, Florence. How are you? <laughs> Pretty well. Next. Okay, thanks very much. I too am a member of the Iowa City Dear Friends, <clears throat> and I wanted to expand and reiterate some of the good points that were made earlier. Lori Crawford mentioned Dana, Dana Cola's statement. After 30 years of shooting, he found that the situation had not changed. That should give you pause. He makes his living by doing this. And I believe he at one time thought it was more effective. It's also um, not only ineffective, but expensive. Past experience here and elsewhere indicates that long-term programs are costly and have little or no effect. And as Laurie mentioned, sometimes the population rises in the second year because the deer compensate. The last time we did this, it cost nearly a million dollars, and here we are. Such a program serves a minority population and is highly offensive to others. And by minority, I mean, I looked at the map. I was only able to see it today. But in the year 2017, in the entire city, there were eight deer complaints. And as mentioned, we have a petition of 500 persons that we submitted who would like to see alternative methods tried. So I'd suggest that the council should first consider, is there a problem? Are there alternatives? Are these effective? And have we tried these first? First, alternatives. One of them is long-term contraception programs. These are used uh, increasingly in recent years. There's one now underway in Clifton, Ohio, that started in 2015, and there are others. Um, and then there are mixed programs that sharpshoot and contracept. Then there's the issue of adapting the park and the habitat, um, fencing, hedging, tree plantings at the east edge of Hickory Hill Park and elsewhere. And I'd like to read from our website, I See Dear Friends, um, what is said on, on gardens. Public education about deer-resistant repellent plantings, fencing options, and repellents empowers citizens to protect their plants. Many of these products are available locally, and some, such as deer off stakes by Have a Heart, offer satisfaction guarantees. Eight to 10 foot fencing, lower fencing with hedges, double fencing, and 45 degree angle fencing will keep deer out. Deer will not attempt to jump over something if they cannot see what lies beyond it. Netting and tree guards protect trees and plants. These are permanent solutions. Killing is not. Now, I looked at some of these complaints are from the Bluffwood area, and that's right near the east edge of Hickory Hill Park. Those are very fine homes. I assume the people have, have gardeners. If those homes were just re-landscaped on the edges, and if, if Hickory Hill Park were adapted on that eastern edge so they'd go back in rather than out. I think even those 
most concerned would find this a preferable solution. And it'd certainly be cheaper to offer people not only advice, but um, compensation for their alterations than to have a major uh, program thrown back on the city in expensive ways. Okay, third, the problem has been inadequately assessed, I believe. Dinicola has a conflict of interest because he's the one who counts the deer, then he's the one who reports on how successful it is. Um, I think the city has an obligation to move on these fronts, since after any killing, the problem will recur. Several non-lethal methods haven't yet been implemented, but the um, people who manage the park might help. And um, people who manage their programs of information in those neighborhoods. So I think we should make a serious effort at long, a long-term solution of adaptive um, response before turning to more violent, the more violent non-solution of killing. Thanks. Thank you, Florence. Hi, Chrissy. Jim. Good evening, my name is Chrissy Canganelli. I'm executive director of Shelter House, and I'm here not with a concern this evening, but to express my deep gratitude and my highest regard for the city council and the leadership within the city staff, and in particular for Steve Rackus, who I hope is still here somewhere tonight, and Tracy Hyshu. Um, it's only been with their leadership and, and, and your support that uh, we've been able to move forward with the recent, in, recent initiative, Cross Park Place. Um, so we're deeply grateful for the recent amendments to the uh, Housing Authority's administrative plan to create the targeted preferences and the project-based voucher program uh, allowance for the Cross Park Place project. Um, it, it makes our work possible, and it is a demonstration of the fact that to end homelessness in our community, that these intentional partnerships need to happen between both the public and private sector. Uh, your work, your decisions, your leadership is inspiring communities across this state and across this region, and I think that that's important for you to know. Um, it's inspiring to my colleagues uh, when I have conversations and conferences across the country, and um, I'm just so deeply grateful so thank you so very much. Thank you, Chrissy. And thanks for the great work you all do at Shelter House. Hi, I'm Brandon Ross. I, uh, piggybacking on the uh, end of what uh, she said, I spoke recently with a homeless man who uh, he'd uh, never been homeless until about the past five years. Since then, he's been on and off homeless. And uh, he has worked in many jobs and also uh, was part of the armed services for a while. And uh, I see him, he talks with me uh, outside at the coffee shop I go to. And I asked him if he could give me three concerns that, uh, that he had that he could put in order, or if he would even go to the council, but he won't come to the council. But so for him, without mentioning any names, uh, I will give you his, his three things that he's concerned about. Um, one, thing, uh, one thing would be uh, to have transportation on Sunday. Uh, this puts homeless people at a great disadvantage that we can hardly imagine ourselves. We can't. Um, two would be to open up uh, shelters, uh, provisional shelters, earlier in the wintertime uh, than, than we have now. That puts people uh, in mortal danger to be out in the cold. Um, and his third was to have to have some place on Sunday that was in town where they could have uh, food, a bank. Um, so the one was Sunday transportation. The other is opening up shelters sooner in the winter. And uh, the third was a food bank in town 
that uh, that would help feed people. He is actively homeless. And speaking to him, I feel like I'm talking with a very intelligent person who knows so much more than I do, as I've been fortunate in my life not to have to have been homeless. Um, as I see the, the top seven points, or the seven points that the city is considering itself uh, with, I see that there is an absence of this in the seven, uh, in this particular area. And now the person who spoke before me, whose name has just escapes me, uh, thank you for doing the work that you have been doing, and I also appreciate that. To, uh, to this man, perhaps a lot is abstract as to what's going on. And to a lot of homeless people, even the city council meetings are abstract. So those were his, his, his ideas. He also brought up uh, about how, how many places there are in town that are, are unoccupied, uh, business spaces that seem open, and he sees that there are spaces for people and doesn't understand why that these empty spaces, empty for a long time, cannot be used to house him and the people that he knows. And it's not just men, it's women and children sometimes. So I'm just here on his behalf tonight uh, to speak uh, where he may not and to ask the council to make considerations along these lines and other related lines, and to even perhaps bring it up whenever possible. Uh, these are people who are growing in numbers and are becoming a larger population sector. And it's great to talk about diversity and finance and economy and other great things that the city is doing. I fully support all of those. And to also please uh, remember these points by this gentleman and I hope that, uh, that some things can be further done to help. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Hi, Royce Ann. Hi, Jim. Royce Ann Porter. Um, congratulations, Chrissy. I, too, would like to say thank you um, for that project. It's so much needed in our city. We talk about affordable housing here in Iowa City. We. Uh, been talking about different stuff like this for so long, um, working with homeless people and working. People live where they can afford. And so I'm here to talk about uh, what you talked about on the work session earlier um, about the um, university. Um, and it's a great idea. It is. It's truly a great idea, but Rockney, John, Pauline, and Jim, when you guys was running, we stood with Rose Oaks. To me, this project that you're doing reminds me of Rose Oaks again. If those people are already in this home, and you're talking about revitaliza revitalization, remodeling it, whatever, making it whatever, but you know the people who in it. You know the people who live in these homes. You know the people who live on Taylor and Davis Street. On behalf of the Black Voices Project, we talked about this. We, you know who those people are that live over there. You know their situations. You guys know that neighborhood. You know when we talk about minimum wage, some of them, a lot of people over in that area, some have to work it. One, two jobs. Kids is even can't do sports because they have to come home to babysit. Y'all know the area. Y'all know that they're not going to qualify for a mortgage. If you would just some kind of way just rethink, some kind of way that the homes that you want to remodel or do whatever to it, if there's a way that you can help these families. Some kind of way um, home ownership can be put into it to the people that's already over there. That's all I'm asking. Slow the process down instead of us, because this makes me feel like we're at Rose Oaks again. Here we are. You're saying you're willing to take these people and put them somewhere else in another home, put, place them somewhere else. How about giving them home ownership? How about making it a way where those that's living there already can become homeowners? That's all I'm asking. We've been through this before. And it's not, to me, it's not a good feeling. I didn't want to get up here 
but I couldn't sit no more. I was like, this just feels like, here we go again. And the idea sounds good, but when we think about it, we doing it again. If y'all look at it, it's happening all over again. Y'all already know that those people are not gonna qualify for home ownership just by going into a bank. We know this. So I'm asking if you would just kind of like maybe rethink it, if we can just, I don't know. I, I really just don't know. I just feel hurt by it. That, and, I, and I couldn't sit without saying something. Thank you, Roy You're welcome. I was going to say anyone else, but I see someone coming. Good evening. Hello, Hello uh, Christine Taylor. This is Michael Taylor here. Uh, we live on Dearborn Street. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about the city park rides today. Um, I understand that the decision has already been made to get rid of the rides, and they've already been put up for sale. Um, and I did create a petition um, to save the rides before I knew that it was a done deal, before I knew that they had already sold the rides. Um, so I guess what I'm here today to say is that why not use the money from the sale of the rides to buy new rides, since the issue with the rides is that um, they're too old and too expensive to maintain. So um, since we're going to be spending a lot of money on getting you know, new playground equipment, um, why not put that money towards getting some new rides instead? Um, and when I put out the petition, I expected to only get maybe 20 or 30 people to sign it. But I had um, a total of 142 as of today. And the comments on it, I, I did email it to you, so you should have a copy of it. But do read the comments that people had said, because um, there's some really good ideas in there. And a lot of people are even willing to have fundraisers. And I'd be willing to help with that, too, to have a fundraiser to get some new rides. Um, and the reason that this really resonates with me is because I, like many of many members of our community, grew up with those rides. I have happy memories of those rides. Um, I remember going there on Labor Day and riding the rides. That was just what I did every year. And now I have children of my own, and they enjoyed the rides. But unfortunately, they won't be able to enjoy them anymore since they are no more. Um, but I had a, a lot of um, older people comment saying that they enjoyed them when they were children, and then their children enjoyed them, and now their children's children are enjoying them. And the hope is that we can continue this tradition, carry it on, um, and so that you know our children's children can have these rides. Because although the argument is that there's a lot of things to do in Iowa City for families, there's really not. And yeah, we have a lot of parks, and it would be cool to have a, you know, a cool new playground equipment. But this, these rides are a part of Iowa City history. I, I read up on the history. It's quite interesting. Um, they've been around as, as long as my parents have been around. And it was something that they put together to give these young families something to do. And I, I mean, I even read a story about somebody who had their wedding at these rides. So there's some really good stories behind it. And we, um, the city here, we have a problem with destroying historical things. And you know, we want our children to learn to appreciate and admire our history. So why should we continue to get rid of these historical objects when we can instead keep them, or in, in this case, get new and just continue the tradition with, with new rides? All right, thank you. Thanks, Christine. Michael, are you going to say anything? Yeah. Well, I'm Michael, and I wanted to say that we should save the rides because we don't want to have to go to Cedar Rapids or Des Moines to go to, like, Adventureland or Lost Island and spend $100, or we could just go to the rides and spend 50 cents. And... And I think we should, people are, they're building these huge apartments, hotels, and I think we, they could like take some money out of it to fix up or even get new rides because 
we have so many hotels and apartments already. And I think we could, like, do a fundraiser, too, or something. And, like, what my mom said, they're historical. And we're destroying a lot of historical things already in Iowa City. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else? Good evening. Hi, well, hello, my name is Andrew McCubbin. Um, I live at 629 Kirkwood, 629 Kirkwood Ave. Um, I'm just gonna double check if there's gonna be discussion on the traffic calming, and if so, I'll wait till then to have my... Um, on Kika Street? Highland? Yeah, for Highland, yep. Yeah. Number 11. Number 11. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so we'll get to it in a few minutes. There will be discussion, though. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great, that, that works, I can wait. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one else, we'll move on to item 10, University Sale, 727 North Lucas Street. This is a resolution authorizing conveyance of a single family home located at 727 North Lucas. I'll open the public hearing. What do you want to, want to address this topic? Okay, seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing. Move the resolution. Second. Moved by Mem, seconded by Cole. Yep. Discussion. I just want to continue sighing on this kind of, uh, I, I've been seeing this coming a lot during meetings, like the university sale, city sales, you know, like many, since I become on this council, I see many, quite many of them come out, which is, I will appreciate the hard work that the staff do on this, but I still want to say the university city house will cost the buyer $207.45, $7,000. And 4500, you know, 450, which what was the amount, which is, it is the amount of the, of course, rehab that the city pay for it. They buy it, they are not making profit. They buy, you know, selling it for the same amount, which is great to, again, to make the neighborhood stable because renters, they don't make the neighborhood stable, and we want more ownership. But I would really think if we can use the same thing and to decide, you know, like try to reduce the cost by using some kind of another fund, and so we can sell it affordable. We've been doing this quite often, and think about it if you put a low income person there which is, will make the, you know, the neighborhood more, yeah, they will stay on the neighborhood cool because, you know, low income people also can do that. And I don't know, I just think this program, somehow, I know that, may, you know, no one will agree with me on this, but I would like to lay my values all the time, over and over, even though I know I don't have support. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I'd like to observe that I, I walk by this house probably every day. Uh, I'm really pleased that our city has been able to rehabilitate it and make it available at a reasonable price to um, an owner who, uh, and to an owner and to know that the compliance period, it has to remain in home ownership for another 30 years. Uh, this will be a very good thing for that particular neighborhood. It's been very good for other neighborhoods in the city as well. So far, we have purchased 68 homes to date, and of the 68, 63 have been rehabilitated and sold. Uh, I believe it's been a terrific program, and I'm very pleased that this particular house is, is part of that program. Any other discussion? I'm always impressed by the before and after photos. Good job. And I would just comment that this 
program was never designed to be an affordable housing program. It was designed to be neighborhood stabilization, particularly in areas where we have a, a really, really high percentage of rental housing, and to try and increase at least minimally the the number of homeowners. There, there's plenty of studies and statistics that document if you get too out of whack in terms of rental versus home ownership, the stability or lack of stability within those neighborhoods, especially if you don't have long-term renters who are really concerned about the neighborhood. It speaks to nothing about any individual. It's just kind of the, the, the dynamics that you get when you don't have um, a certain percent of home ownership. Um, so I think this is an important program, and obviously the, the city in other ways have put a, has put a lot of money into the affordable housing. So I don't feel like in voting for this that I am not voting for my values as well. It's just we have different pots of money to do different kinds of things. I, I really want to add something again. Uh, <laughs> Because, you know, I understand this is not affordable. God, the problems. This is not affordable house, but we are doing it. We are doing it. And why we don't just make it affordable so we can, like, make more affordable housing, like, be established in Iowa City, especially on those kind of neighborhood where we're doing right now. If we, that will be like we, we integrating people who are low income with other people around them who are not. The price, $207, is not reasonable for a lot of people. It's 80% of the area median income. No, we need to think carefully about the people who are less than that, 30%, 40%, even 50%. You know, that's why. And also, I just realized that who are buying those houses is not the low income people, are not the people of color, are not our low income people. That's why I'm saying we are doing it. We are spending some money in here. Just try to figure out a way. We have a great staff to figure out a way. This to be like affordable. I would like to highlight that. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Cole? Yes. Sims? Yes. Sully? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Rod Morton? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 11, Highland Avenue traffic calming. This is a resolution authorizing the installation of speed bumps on Highland Avenue between Boyerham Street and Keokuk Street. Could I have a motion to approve, please? Move. Second. Moved by Soleil, seconded by Mims. Discussion, would anybody like to address this topic? Good evening. My name is Lyle Deeds. I live at 913 DeForest in Iowa City, Iowa. And as you can tell, I don't address the council very often. I am Welcome. adamantly opposed to this particular project. It has been tried on Highland several years ago. Half of you, maybe most of you, weren't around when they had traffic calming devices on Highland Avenue years past, within the last 10 years. Great expense to the city, traffic calming devices, try to navigate traffic around islands, unsuccessful. Great expense to the city. Highland is now a thoroughfare without any traffic calming devices. And the whole point of that was to slow traffic down. I understand the citizens that are in this two or three block are concerned about the high speed of traffic. I personally drive this particular stretch of Highland almost every day. I don't necessarily speed. I can't speak to other people. Traffic calming devices, whether they're speed bumps or navigational devices, 
inhibit emergency vehicles, police department, fire department, ambulance, snow plows when they're plowing, street cleaners, let alone to wear and tear on vehicles that are just driving this at normal speeds. It is a small three, perhaps four block at the most designated area that they're trying to calm down. I understand Highland Park that maybe a lot of you don't know. It's a tremendously small park, but is visited by people. It is also on a corner where people have to slow down. I do not believe this is necessary. There are many, in my opinion, places, if you actually want to calm traffic down, that are much more inclined to be traffic calming devices necessary in this community rather than the three or four block area of Highland Avenue. I am adamantly opposed to this. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle. Uh, Kent, did you plan to say a few words about this? And Okay. All right. Okay. Anyone else? Welcome. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Bob Temple. I live at 1402 Ewell Street, which intersects with Highland Avenue to the east of the proposed speed humps. I'm here to encourage you to vote yes on this installation of speed humps between Boyram and Keokuk. As a resident of the historic Lucas Farms neighborhood, I've long been a proponent of initiatives that would reduce traffic speeds on Highland Avenue. More than one traffic study along this street has shown that speeds exceed the established means set by the city. In fact, these studies have shown that speeds often exceed the posted limit by 10 miles per hour or greater. A motorist traveling to Kirkwood College or Sycamore Mall from Gilbert Street has three main route options. Kirkwood Avenue has a stoplight at either end, and it has three stop signs in between. <clears throat> Highway 6 has a stoplight at each end, and it has three stoplights in between. Highland Avenue, with only one stop sign along a one-mile length, has become a speedy alternative. Motorists frustrated with this 25 mile per hour zone are often, or on occasion at least, will pass motorists traveling too slow for them. Although I do support the speed hump initiative on the west end of Highland, something needs to be done on the east end as well. As you consider approval of tonight's proposal, I urge you to take a close look at the traffic calming process as a whole. Why are city residents being held accountable for speed enforcement? The posted limit is the law. It requires enforcement by whatever means necessary to ensure the safety of the residents in our neighborhood. I urge the council to examine other alternatives, such as raised crosswalks, choker medians, and solar-powered radar-activated speed signs. Speeds are excessive along the length of Highland Avenue, and I urge you to initiate measures to help ensure the safety of the neighborhood while also controlling the speed of traffic within established limits. So tonight, vote yes, but please don't stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else? Good evening. Kathleen Thornton. I live at 718 Highland Avenue, and I uh, wanted to come up and say a few words. I live right in the middle of this section we're talking about for speed control, and I've watched this happen on our street for 24 some years. I've lived there for 24 some years on Highland Avenue at 718 Highland Avenue. I think um, Kent and Sarah probably got up and, and maybe spoke, and I guess I'm not sure, but I know they posted and given you lots of facts. And for me, the facts speak for themselves. Traffic calming is clearly needed on Highland Avenue. Our section as well as the other sections too, but this is the one we're talking about right here. 
this little section between Keokuk and Boyram. You know, some neighbors talk about wanting a four-way stop at Keokuk and Highland, and I'm not opposed to that, but that has nothing to do with our calming on Highland Avenue. We're talking about our little section that's just had things completely out of control for years. A recent post to our Lucas Farms Facebook page said, history repeats itself with a question mark and actually included a cartoon of the chicanes from back in 1999. For me, the history that needs to stop repeating itself is the history of the speed on our section of Highland. So I'm asking you to vote yes for this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Any, uh, um, we've, we've already heard what you had to say. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh, my name is Andrew McCubbin. I am a uh, resident at 629 Kirkwood Ave. All right. Um, so I'm going to get started with a couple of questions, um, things that I hope that have been clarified for the council. Um, uh, the objective of traffic regulation is to increase safety and efficiency of road travel. Um, are increased regulations or flow impediments needed to increase safety or efficiency in the case of Highland Ave? Um, I'm requesting clarification on whether the complaints are a matter of vehicles driving too fast or are too many vehicles using the road. Have any traffic or engineering studies been done after every speed hump installation to show the efficacy um, uh, of safety or efficiency um, with these installations? Um, so the current state on the history, obviously there's been some uh, traffic calming mechanisms um, implemented in the past that have seemed to be unsuccessful and or um, not satisfactory to the residents of Highland. Um, obviously there's currently lane lines. Um, those were intended to mitigate um, high speeds, which in of themselves don't cause accidents. Um, there's lots of statistics, statistics excuse me, um, to, that show that um, uh, speed in of itself is not a, a direct factor in most accidents. In fact, most accidents happen lower than 35 miles per hour. Um, so I would like to ask, has there been an engineering study besides the traffic flow numbers that were submitted as part of the um, uh, packet with regard to um, the, um, uh, the decision to do traffic calming? Um, has there been a comprehensive traffic flow study to see how traffic calming on Highland would affect the um, flow of traffic on Highway 6, Gilbert, Keokuk, or Kirkwood Ave? Um, I'm a resident that lives on Kirkwood Ave, and I want to—I know there's traffic issues on Kirkwood Ave itself. Um, and based on having driven on Highland, um, it seems like there's other avenues to go ahead and fix the, the calming issue, both on Kirkwood and possibly on Highland, rather than just putting speed bumps. I think this is a bigger problem than just speed hump installation and lowering traffic speeds. Uh, so. Uh, the first thing I want to point out, um, based on the study locations of Highland Avenue, um, a majority of the vehicle traffic is west of Boyram, um, which is all commercial. Um, this is, I believe, three blocks worth of um, commercial buildings. And um, based on the 2014, 2016, 2017 um, traffic flow studies, um, only that portion of the street would qualify for traffic calming if the traffic calming program is to be read and I would consider um, uh, Highland to be a collector street, not a local street, and correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, and if that definition is um, what you're using to determine calming, um, only the west side of Highland Ave would qualify for that based on averages I'm seeing here. Excuse me. Um, and also, if, if we have speed limits that are 10 miles per hour over the speed limit, there should be a question of whether or not the speed limit's appropriate. Most instances um, where engineering studies are done and traffic limits are raised, or speed limits, excuse me, are raised, um, it's due to the fact that the 85th percentile is above the posted speed limit. Um, so if there's a statutory limit that's imposing the 25 mile per hour limit, I would advise you to do an engineering study to determine whether or not that statutory limit is appropriate for that street and whether or not that street's classified correctly. Um, 
I can go into some of the state law provisions about that, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and make this a little bit more abbreviated since you want it to limit it to five minutes. Um, a couple other questions I have is um, law enforcement of Highland Ave. Um, are there any, um, I should say, official reports and statistics on the number of traffic violations that are committed on Highland Avenue and how many um, accidents have occurred on Highland due to speed, um, especially over the 25 mile per hour speed limit? Um, why haven't there been saturation patrols executed on Highland Ave? Um, is this just a deterrent issue, or is it actually um, something that the city needs to spend money on in order to um, have traffic calmed? Um, let's see here. Uh, I, got, I got into uh, how, how does the city think traffic should flow? Um, if we are finding enough traffic volume that's um, happening on Highland, it's got to be for a reason. If we want to have that, that traffic be flowing on other streets or um, on Highway 6 to the south, um, there should be a determination of what um, needs to be done to make sure that we mitigate the traffic volumes on Highland Ave um, and not just reduce speed. As I said, speed in and of itself doesn't cause accidents. Um, it's, it's based on many other factors. The main thing is distracted driving. Um, so I would, I would think that um, there's other ways that we can go about doing this without either spending a spending money or spending less money than we have are proposing to spend on uh, the four speed humps. Um, uh, reading through a lot of the community suggestions based on this um, proposal, um, a lot of people seem to think that a four-way stop at Kia Cook and Highland Ave would be a solution. Um, based on the traffic data that I'm seeing here, that's not problem point. It seems like the problem point would be west of Boyram, and if we were going to make a um, change in signage, it should happen on Boyram and Gilbert Court. Um, I would propose that instead of changing um, Keokuk and Highland, that we make a, an effort to reassess uh, and do an engineering study and figure out what are the other options potentially for cheaper methods simply based on signage and directing traffic flow. Um, so I think I'm going to leave it with that. Um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, I would like to determine also um, the mechanism to which we measure the effectiveness of these speed humps if you do indeed vote to implement them. Are you going to be doing a study every year for the next three years to look at traffic flows and, and traffic speeds to see if they are calmed? Um, obviously with having speed humps here, you're going to have to be very careful with how you place your traffic flow sensors um, as It'll be very much skewed if you place one right after a speed hump or right before. Um, so I want to know, um, as a council, what decisions will be made to, to make sure that the efficacy of these speed humps in general all around the city are actually working. Um, so I'll leave it with that. I won't take too much more of your time. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Kat, I'm going to have to ask you to come up, please. Andrew just um, asked quite a few questions. Um, I'm sure you can't begin to answer all of them right here and now. Were there any key questions that you heard that you know you can address based on the kind of work you all do? Yeah, there's a few things. Kent Ralston, transportation planner. Um, yeah, I, I won't um, attempt to answer all of those, but a few, I think the salient points are, you know, is there a study done afterwards? There is. We go and measure the the speeds, in this case, of volume. Uh, should we put speed humps uh, on Highland? Uh, we'll do that. I can say for the dozen or so installations we have in town, they work. Um, they're one of the more effective ways that we know how to uh, calm traffic. And in fact, when we have our community meetings with the neighborhoods uh, early on in the stages of traffic calming, we offer other solutions. Um, but when they ask me, what do you know that works the best, is cost effective, a lot of our uh, residents are, are interested in the cost. Um, I usually tell them the speed humps are, the, are a sure bet, and uh, I think our, our data does back that up. Uh, as far as um, some of the other public comments, as far as emergency response, uh, we have a traffic calming committee uh, that meets before we ever meet with the neighborhood to make sure that we're only offering solutions that the city feels comfortable with, or at least city staff feels comfortable with, um, and that includes the uh, fire chief. Um, and the fire chief has indicated that he, you know, he, he's never a proponent of traffic, 
uh, calming in general because it kind of goes against the grain of what they what they do uh, that he was not uh, ultimately concerned with this installation and that's not been the case uh, in, in some instances in the past where the fire chief has indicated a strong opposition to these um, and that we've went other directions okay thanks Ken mm -hmm. I see at least one other person would like to say something I'm actually a visitor to Iowa City. Welcome. Um, I've enjoyed my visit. Um, <laughs> but uh, visiting Andrew, um, getting to his place would require getting over some speed humps uh, through one of the, the easier routes to get there if this uh, plan were to go forward. Could, the, the, could you uh, say your name, please? My name is David Dixon, sorry. Um, what? Dixon. Dixon? Dixon. And, and I guess what I'm seeing here, you know, as somebody that, other than a, an occasional visit, wouldn't be affected by this at all, is that it seems unclear what, what question we're trying, or what problem we're trying to solve. Um, I haven't heard any, any discussion of accidents on Highland Avenue, haven't heard any discussions of police enforcement, you know, not being able to effectively control the existing speed limit. The data that is presented suggests that, if anything, the speed limit might be underposted from an engineering and safety standpoint. And I don't see that speed humps are going to make that safety proposition any better. And as has been brought up a couple of places, it potentially gets worse. It's going to take a fire truck longer to get down the street. Um, I, I imagine if you talk to your police uh, officers, when they've got a choice of which route to take to get from Gilbert over to the east side of Iowa City, they're not going to take Kirkwood. They're going to take Highland. And the reason is it's a, it's a wide open street that they can safely operate at a much higher speed. And while that's disconcerting to the person that lives on Highland Avenue, they don't, you know, nobody wants somebody driving pat, fast past their house. You're ultimately trying to solve a que or answer a question of how do we efficiently get not just the police, but every member of the Iowa City community efficiently from one place to another. If you divert somebody away from Highland Avenue or slow down the travel on Highland Avenue, it's going to increase the likelihood that somebody takes a different route and potentially a less safe one. You may have fewer people speeding on Highland Avenue, but more accidents at the intersection of Kirkwood and Dodge. So think about the big safety picture and whether, whether it's a safety problem you're trying to address or whether it's something else. Thank you. Thank you, David. And welcome to Iowa City. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one else, council discussion? Well, I would just say that I you know, thank people for coming out tonight and speaking both, you know, for and against this. But in the years that I've been on the council, I've had pretty good confidence in, in most of the time with what our staff has done in terms of looking at these traffic calming situations, getting the input from the neighbors, um, the, the threshold that that needs to meet in terms, in terms of even going forward and doing the analysis. And um, we've had a few that we've taken out over the years, but very few. Um, and I think in most cases, um, the vast majority of the residents have been supportive of these, and so I'm going to vote for it. I'm going to uh, thank everyone for, for coming out and speaking on this. And I also noticed uh, today, and in, in just looking up uh, on our staff report, there were some, in some of the letters we received that uh, got quite a bit of uh, conversation out in the Highland neighborhood in terms of uh, the, the, um, the project and peripheral concerns, at least to the scope of this. Um, you know, I have to say straight up that, or initially, that I, I, have always, I always prefer other ways of solving uh, traffic speeds. I, I, I certainly support the neighborhood's concerns about um, this is a residential street, not frustrating traffic, just slowing it down. Um, if I don't know if, if staff looked at the idea of how more friction could be created on, on Highland through bike lanes. Apparently, there isn't enough demand for street parking to kind of reduce the effect of lane widths, which we know slows traffic down. Um, 
in looking at the bike master plan, I, I believe um, Highland is considered a secondary route, so there is some potential, and maybe that's still there that could be looked at in terms of how to uh, slow traffic down on the corridor, because I think that's, there. there's this small project and then there's speed on Highland as a whole. Um, and, and I think that that needs to be looked at as well, and perhaps the bike, a bike lane concept could could solve that. Um, the the scope of the the speed humps is relatively limited. I, I don't think it. You know, I prefer looking at the corridor as a whole, but you know, I, I don't know that I don't sense that speed humps in this one area will in any way set back the idea of of treating the corridor as a whole. Uh, I did find the idea of uh, a four-way stop at Highland Keokuk uh, pretty interesting. Um, I would just add to that that th in looking at the map of this area, there aren't many, uh, as, as Bob Temple noted, there aren't many east-west streets, um, and there are, frankly aren't that many north-south streets that sort of run through the neighborhood. The east end has a little bit more of a grid pattern, but Further west, it's you know there isn't a lot of ways to get through the neighborhood from end to end. Kirkwood Highland is one of those intersections. It's kind of like a crossroad of two major streets, and it has a park and it has a church. My hope in the in terms of looking at that intersection, it would be almost viewed as a kind of neighborhood center, rather than a place where traffic's flying through. So, if, if traffic could be calmed down there, you know it, at that intersection, not through the corridor or through a block, but at that intersection, make the crossing safer. Um, that intersection, I think, could be considered more of a, a centerpiece of the neighborhood rather than cut up and divided by the, the through traffic. Um, and I think that Bob made an interesting point about how, you know, if you compare it to Kirkwood and uh, Highway 6, it's more of a, th at least in terms of stops, more of a thoroughfare than um, uh, you know these other other two streets to the north and south. So, the idea of how how can we make safe crossings, just like we have on Highway Six and and uh, Kirkland, occur along the uh, Highland Corridor, is something I think could be looked at as well. You know, anytime we make a decision, we have to look at community feedback, the process we have in place in terms of survey results, as well as our staff's considered judgment. And I think in this particular case, um, we have the survey results of nearly 81% in support of this. We have our staff's considered judgment. We also have our own observations sitting on council about the efficacy of these particular devices. And I think primarily what we're looking at is the livability and the safety of our individual streets. And I think this goes a long way to addressing this, and it's based upon empirical data. That doesn't mean that we're not going to continue to review this, but I think in this particular case, making our streets safer, making our neighborhoods more livable, does involve regulating traffic speeds. And I think if we can do that in the least intrusive way possible, that's always our goal. Um, and in this particular case, I think this is a, a sensible approach based upon the information that we have um, before us. Now, we're not always going to make everyone happy, uh, but consider for everyone that's opposed to it, there's uh, legions of people that are supportive of it as well. And, and we try to balance all of those uh, preferences based upon our existing policies as well as our staff's professional judgment. So I'm going to be supportive of this. I think it's a sensible approach. For me, I think, you know, I really don't have experience on, like, uh, going on those two, maybe too much to, yes, figure out if there is, like, really speed people speed up over there or not but really always i would love to see if the city before they do anything to contact the people who live there and from the moment that we get i think the city contacted 100 percent of the people which is 20 in this case it's 20 families i guess or 20 household almost maybe 100 percent but 55 percent only respond which is 11. Even though if I add the people who came tonight, and thank you very much for coming and like comment on this, but if I add those people to the 20% that like, uh, you know, really don't want this, it's still the people who want it is more than the people who don't want it. And I think this is, that means this is concern, concern of safety.
uh, that's why you know if, if there is a concern of safety even though it's like really like low percent of concern as long as it's about safety we have to look into that and I will be supporting of this resolution you know thing thanks I also would echo um, thank you to the um, members of the audience that spoke up, uh, as well as to the folks that uh, we received correspondence from. We got a lot of correspondence from people uh, regarding this, and, and we do pay attention to that. Uh, what uh, um, struck me the most was the traffic study. I was really alarmed by the speeds that were shown, uh, that uh, they uh, watched this for some time. and. Uh, it, well over the limits. I have a friend that thinks driving seven miles over the speed limit is acceptable, but that's not. Uh, as somebody said, it's posted for a reason. Um, that's just not acceptable. It's not safe. I, I live uh, just a short distance from Tech Drive, which had, has had speed humps for a very long time, and it, it, it's been successful. It's, it runs right along a park, and there had been a lot of issues with that area for a long time, and that has controlled the speeds on, on that street, and, and we haven't noticed any problems with any uh, emergency vehicles or anything of that nature. So I, I would be in favor of this, but I do agree with um, Mr. Temple that uh, we should at some point consider the other end of Highland as well, because obviously people are using this as, as a cross street. Well, I don't want to repeat what other people have already said. <clears throat> I'll just uh, highlight a couple or three things. Uh, a suggestion was made that uh, perhaps we should have police enforcement out there. Uh, I think that's not really viable because we only have so many officers, they, and we have plenty of streets, and there are lots of instances where people drive uh, above the speed limit and have some, create similar kind of challenges as what we're witnessing on Highland Avenue. So I, I don't think we can expect to have police enforcement out there. Another, at least not in any kind of regular way, uh, another has to do with the idea of possibly raising the speed limit because people drive over the 25 mile an hour speed limit. But we don't want to do that because the, the higher the speed, the more likely it is that severe damage will occur. The, the risk of severe accidents, accidents increases with increasing speed. Uh, I don't have any desire to do that. The other thing I just want to mention is that a little over a week ago, I was in Highland Park attending the party in the park with quite a large number of families, many of whom had small children. And I repeatedly heard from these families how important it was to slow the traffic down on Highland. And they also supported the idea of having a four-way stop at Keokuk, but that's that's another thing. So um, given those factors and given what other people have said, I'm going to support this motion. Any other discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Motion carries 6 to 0. Could I have a motion to accept correspondence, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Cole, second by Thomas. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 12, settlement of impending litigation. This is a resolution ratifying the settlement of impending litigation. Move the resolution. Second. Uh, moved by Mims, seconded by Soleil. Um, Eleanor, could you briefly explain what this is? Um, yes, this is a, a claim that was made against us um, due to damage to a car from um, a backed up, backed up storm sewer in the tower place ramp. Um, we had several of these claims, um, and this one exceeded the city manager's um, settlement authority of $20,000, so it comes to you for approval. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Sully? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Motion carries 6 to 0. Item 13, council appointments. 13A has to do with the Telecommunications Commission. <clears throat> there are two vacancies to fill three-year terms. We received one application from Kyla Patterson. There's no gender balance requirement. Uh, what's your judgment, folks? I really would like to, you know, appoint like Kayla Patterson to this. 
agree. One thing I do, I, I think there's sentiment to a point, or we'll find out in a second, but one thing I'm wondering about has to do with the discussion we had, I think, two weeks ago about this particular commission and about uh, our questioning whether we should continue it or give it a, a new revised charge. I yeah. can speak to that. Yeah. Um, so our staff liaison, Ty Coleman, brought uh, that particular issue to the to the commission. Mm -hmm. So they are um, going to think through what those particular duties could be or look like as a as a new charge or a new form of whatever this commission would. Um, I think part of that discussion will be whether it should exist in its current format. So they're going to discuss that amongst themselves as a commission and then bring recommendation back to council. So. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. That's very helpful. So the question is, do we want to appoint Kyla Patterson? I, I, Maz said, and Pauline, I think, both said they would like to. I'm seeing a lot yeah, of nodding heads. Sure. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It says there's no gender balance, but there's three males on there already. Yes. So it would be nice to add yeah. Okay. Female. So. Uh, could I have a motion to appoint Kyla Patterson to the Moved. Telecommunications Commission? Second. So, uh, motion moved by Soleil, seconded by Taylor. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 14, announcement of vacancies. New. Uh, so applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. We have one vacancy to fill a five-year term on the Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment. One vacancy to fill a five-year term on the Board of Adjustment. One vacancy to fill a five-year term on the Board of Appeals. And this is an HVAC or building professional position. Uh, three vacancies to fill three-year terms on the Human Rights Commission. Two vacancies to fill four-year terms on the Parks and Recreation Commission. One vacancy to fill a three-year term on the Public Art Advisory Committee. One vacancy to fill a three-year term on the Senior Center Commission. And, this is a late addition, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term on the Public, upon appointment, on the Public Art Advisory Committee. Applications for these positions must be received by 5 p.m. <coughs> Tuesday, November the 13th. Could I have a motion to accept correspondence, please? So move. Second. Uh, move is by Soleil, seconded by Mims. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, all opposed? Hearing none, uh, motion carries. Uh, item 15, announcement of vacancies previous. We have one vacancy to fill a four-year term on the airport commission. Two vacancies to fill five-year terms on the Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment. One vacancy to fill a three-year term on the Historic Preservation Commission for the East College Street uh, District. And one vacancy to fill a three-year term on the Historic Preservation Commission for the Jefferson Street District. These vacancies will remain open until filled. Item 16, community comment. Gustav? Hi, Gustav Stewart, um, student liaison. Good evening to you all. Good evening. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to highlight um, uh, some off-campus housing support initiatives that you, the university and USG have been collaborating on um, for kind of the past year. Um, John Thomas, you mentioned the Neighborhood Ambassadors Program. That was something USG uh, partly funded um, to kind of be a liaison to both students and the community within the neighborhoods and kind of um, do good within the um, community. So there's currently seven um, neighborhood ambassadors and this is the pilot year. So you have seven students um, throughout different neighborhoods um, within Iowa City, some at Riverfront Crossings. I believe there's um, there might be some in College Green as well. Whoever students lied and uh, applied. Um, so I believe they're looking at events to do like um, community raking um, of leaves um, and various things like that. And I can um, inform you on kind of the events that um, do occur throughout the semester, um, throughout the year um, that they decide to put on. Um, in addition, I would like to. Um, I'll let you know about um, the renter's guide that USG, so USG distributed a survey this last spring 
to get data on student experiences on landlord-tenant relations. Um, and we formed this guide, and it's going to be published within the next week. And the idea is to get a quantitative um, understanding um, for both students that are looking for housing um, and for the community to get an understanding of um, what is quantitatively um, student experiences for each landlord and various things like that. So we um, plan on distributing that and I can um, send it into an information packet um, if uh, you want and um, yeah so thank you uh, unless anybody objects um, I'd yeah. be encouraged uh, uh, Gustav to submit that mm -hmm. sure okay item 17 City Council information Pauline would you uh, lead off please then we'll move to the right mm -hmm. sure um, Last week, the uh, Iowa Harm Reduction Coalition held uh, their third annual summit, uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, it was a really uh, great week with a lot of um, good conversation going on, held in partnership with the College of Medicine and, and the uh, Harm Reduction Coalition. It brought together a local and um, as well as international experts, community members, health care providers, and students uh, to hold conversations about the opioid crisis. Uh, the Wednesday evening event, uh, um, a Dr. Daniel Chicarone, uh, professor at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, spoke about what he's been doing with the uh, National Harm Reduction uh, uh, Council. And uh, it was very interesting, and he had some uh, very graphic photos of some things that he has, has seen along the way. There also was a young woman who was instrumental in establishing a safe injection site uh, in Vancouver, Canada. And there's apparently a, a, a push to get those established across our country, but I don't know um, how open people are to that. Uh, Dr. Chikarone stated that the opioid epidemic is the greatest public health crisis of our time. Um, he gave some very alarming statements statistics. Uh, 64, over 64,000 people died due to overdose in our country in 2016 alone. And he spent his entire career trying to improve people's understanding of substance use and abuse and uh, the health consequences associated with that. Um, the, so the summit I felt was uh, very thought-provoking and, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of people attended and, and, and uh, got a lot out of it. Uh, that, and then on Friday, the Johnson County Affordable Housing Coalition held their annual meeting. Uh, it was good to hear all the great efforts being made in our uh, area uh, towards affordable housing. Uh, both Mayor uh, Pro Tem um, Mitch Gross and our own Mayor Jim Throgmorton uh, shared some impressive information on how things are going in, in our communities. It was good to hear about Corval. We don't hear about them much, but they are also doing some things uh, uh, in relation to affordable housing. Uh, and of course, uh, the candidates forum was last Thursday. I found that very interesting. A large number of people were present, and it was great to see such interest in our council. Uh, it looks like there was a there by Someone. latest numbers is uh, something like 9% voter turnout, which yeah, that's not a lot, but uh, at least that shows there's some interest, and we will have somebody joining us in two weeks, which will be great. Um, come up Coming is the Gateway event. I'm looking forward to that at City Park, 9 a.m. on uh, Thursday the 16th uh, to kind of... Uh, announce or open up the new uh, gateway area there. And then uh, Susan had mentioned the IP item, uh, the invitation to the state of poverty in Johnson County discussion, uh, Friday, October 12th, 9 a.m. to noon at the HHS building, uh, room 203, strategies to address issues of poverty in our community. Uh, they did encourage registration, and you can go to the, the web page and, and register online, but you can probably also just show up. Okay, uh, I really don't have a lot. I always forget, but you know, I attended uh, yesterday the green room at the Inger Theater. Oh my God, that was great for me for first time. I attend this kind of things. It's pretty impressive. I love it. I like the speaker, and I like the song made by the you know. Uh, Nigerian American students, which is really, it was very nice. And uh, my child was with me. I think that was really great. And I hope to go more often to this kind of event and encourage everybody. Also, the student was amazing. This is, was a really good event. Nothing else, but I really, I guess, received the election result. I would like to thank both candidates who really run for this because we do have 
be you no know, too strong candidate. Hopefully, if we can have like two seats, but you know, unfortunately, we have one. Uh, I really would like to congratulate Bruce Tegan for winning the elections, and also thank Anne for running. This was really high election, but well, because both of them are great. Thanks. Just found that news. So if, with your permission, I'm going to sort of combine my City of Lit update with um, this particular council time. And um, as many of the community members probably know, we do have a wonderful City of Literature um, book festival occurring right now. Um, there's a ton of events that you can sort of find in iowacityliterature.org. But I just want to highlight at least a couple of them that I think may have resonance for the community. Uh, there's a ton of events to go to, but a couple that really interest me. Um, one is, is a guy by... Uh, uh, by Art Cullen called Storm Lake, and it's a book on politics, agriculture, the environment, and immigration in the heartland. I think it's sort of a timely book uh, with all the different issues that our state as a whole is is, is facing. Um, and that event will take place at the Iowa City Public Library, meeting room A, 123 South Lynn Street, Iowa City, Iowa, you know where that is. And it will take place uh, Saturday, October 6th at 4 o'clock p.m. Uh, the other one I wanted to highlight is is a, a huge event. I guess it's a really big deal that we're getting common is coming to uh, Englert, and he's also going to be here um, this Saturday. Um, and he is, has a new book called uh, One Day It All Makes Sense. And the rapt, rapper and actor Common will discuss his mem memoir in this special book festival appearance. That will take place Saturday, October 6th at 2.30 p.m. at the Englert. Um, it's a big get for us to be able to get him, and I'm really excited about that happening. So there's just two events. There's a ton of events that are taking place, and I encourage people to check that uh, festival out this week. I think it's going to be a fantastic uh, event. So that's it. Uh, <clears throat> just a couple of things uh, of note, and I went up to um, the Twin Cities about a week or so ago. Hadn't been up there in quite a while, and uh, always I always enjoy going to places and just seeing you know what the differences are between wherever I happen to be living and uh, the places I'm visiting. Uh, a couple of things that jumped out at me a little bit in Minneapolis was the presence of scooters, um, which are not they haven't landed in Iowa City to my knowledge, but uh, they've landed in Minneapolis, and um, so I'm kind of interested to see how that phenomenon uh, may, may land in Iowa City. They're a little bit disruptive uh, in terms of circulation patterns because, you know, scooters never quite know where to place themselves in the public right-of-way. Uh, you know, they're somewhere between a pedestrian and a bicyclist, more closely aligned, I think, with bicycling. Um, also, uh, I, lots of construction. Uh, you know, we, we We've kind of gone through our construction season. You know, the bigger the city, the more the construction. It was really, especially when you're a visitor, trying to navigate through the construction period in the Midwest is something. And uh, the, the other thing I would note is that I something I don't think about because it's not present in Iowa City, and that is airplane noise. Um, certain parts of Minneapolis really suffer from overhead flights passing over their neighborhoods. Um, I know it's inconvenient getting to, our, to, to some degree inconvenient getting to our airport, but it is completely separate from the major population areas, so it, there's a, there's a, there is some benefit to that. And I hadn't, in my previous visits to Minneapolis, appreciated how impacted some of the neighborhoods are. Nothing. John, you remind me of a party I went to a long time ago out in Los Angeles. Uh, and the party took place inside a house located directly underneath the flight path from LAX, LA International Airport. So like every minute or something like that. <laughs> wow, it was quite the thing. I'm glad we don't uh, have to experience that. All right, so uh, on the 20th, I met with several, uh, a few key administrators at Mercy Hospital. That was pretty instructive for me, and I think it was a, a beneficial conversation from their point of view as well. Later that night, I walked around downtown with other members of the Partnership for Alcohol Safety, trying to gauge what the post-10 p.m. scene is like. And much to our surprise, nothing was going on. Right, Gustav? There's nothing happening. <laughs> Except in one of the bars we went into, which was 
pretty full and pretty active, but <laughs> it, was like, it was boring, frankly, so mm. um, unlike um, some other nights. On the 25th, I had a great conversation with students at Kirkwood, students and faculty at Kirkwood, about their concerns pertaining to the sanctuary city topic from the point of view of um, recent immigrants or perhaps even refugees, but yeah. Uh, there were probably 60 people in the room. Uh, it's a really terrific conversation. I hope it was fruitful from their point of view. I plan to attend ICAD's annual meeting on the 10th of October. On the 11th, I'll be making welcoming comments at the conference of the Iowa chapter of the American Public Works Association. And Jeff, uh, perhaps you could ask somebody to put a few talking notes or whatever together, talking points for me. On the 13th, I plan to attend, I don't know if Maz, you may have, or Pauline, you might have mentioned this, um, I plan to attend the Center for Worker Justice's annual fundraiser. Mm -hmm. yeah. The gala. Yeah, I forget yeah. to say that. <laughs> and uh, the Community Foundation of Johnson County is having a grants award luncheon on the 17th, and I hope to attend that as well. I'm going to be out of town for a few days, so I'm going to give you a heads up here. Uh, Thursday, I'm departing uh, uh, on a trip out to Bend, Oregon, to attend a celebration of life for my cousin Janet, who died recently. So uh, I can't say that I really look forward to that, but, you know, it's something I want to do. And last, I congratulate Bruce Teague, too. I mean, it's, uh, it's um, you know... It was a good election campaign. It was a sprint campaign, is the way it seemed to me. You know, it's the first time we've ever done anything like that, as far as I know. So, congratulations to Bruce, and I understand he's having a his victory party at Billy's Hi Hat. So, I am hmm. planning to walk down there right after our meetings end. That's it for me. Jeff, got anything? Nothing. Ashley? No. Eleanor? Kelly? One thing, I had emailed on the Neighborhood Council, City Council meet and greet, and s there's several of you that are available. I just need two current, <laughs> so whether you want to duke it out. Well, um, who are the people? Um, I know Rockney said he could, Pauline said she could, Jim, you did, the dates didn't work for John. Um, I'm not sure well, Maz, what? if I heard back from you. It did um, not work for John. The days did not work for John. No, no. And you either didn't hear from me or the dates don't work. I don't remember which one. I just know what happened. Um, I know what I had sent out was uh, the 10th or the 11th. So it's of October. October. Okay. What time? Yeah, that's fine. 5.30? I think they were going to confirm the day, but those were the two days they were looking at. Maz, are you interested in doing that? Can you do that? I guess the 11 is full. You can't do it on the 11th. But the 6th, maybe, I don't know. At the 10th, I mean. Um, well, I, I'm like I told you, I'm happy to defer. I don't think Pauline should do it because she's been on many listening posts here yeah, recently. Yeah, that's basically what it's like. Now. Yeah, so Rockney and Maz, if the two sure. of you can go, that'd be great. Tenth, and then if it's the 11th, then Maz has an issue, correct? Yeah, because on the 11th, I have some. Well, how long does this take, by the way? Uh, hour to hour to hour. What did, did y'all do the last time? Hour, because hour, I have some. Hour to hour and a half. I have six, uh, six o'clock. Like, well, like if it's class. on the 11th, I'd be happy to uh, take part along with Rockney. If it's on the 10th, Rockney and Maz? Yeah. Is that okay? Uh, Tens for me work like five o'clock. Is that five thirty? Uh, they were looking at five thirty, last I heard. Five thirty. Why are you said this is gonna be? Five thirty. Which location did she say? Mm, they did not give me a location. Uh, oh, we'll pin that down. To, yeah, okay. To be advised. All right. So you'll get back to us about that, right? Hopefully, first thing in the morning. Okay. okay. I marked my calendar for that. I think we're done. So, could I have a motion to adjourn, please? I think we to need the to, go. Work, okay. to the work session, that is. Okay. Thanks. Moved. Second. Moved by Sally, seconded by Mims. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. We are adjourned from the work session, uh, from the formal meeting.